So just to introduce myself, I'm Hakeem Karim. I'm actually based in Malaysia, um, in KL, and I'm one of the founders of Grid Market. So let me just tell you a bit about what we are. So let me just uh, share my screen. So, you know, let, let me just talk about, I'm just going to quickly talk about us and then I just want to jump straight into the demo. And then, you know, obviously the main thing you wanted to hear is, is from you. So uh, let me just go through this quickly. So uh, what are we about? We're really about accelerating creativity. We basically provide a platform for cloud rendering and simulations. Um, so um, so what is, what is our, our purpose here is that you know, we're really sort of focused on the animation and VFX markets especially, and especially in Houdini. That's kind of one of our uh, portes. Um, we're actually based all around the world. As I said, I'm, I'm in Malaysia. My business partner is actually in San Francisco. We have other people in these other locations that you see, and we have partnered with, obviously not just with SideFX, as you see here, but also with many others like Pixar and Oracle and so forth. And if you're interested, there's a recent Forbes magazine article about us doing, you know, not only just animation and VFX, but also we're actually branching out into drug discovery uh, as well. Um, next slide. So we have, you know, several thousand customers all over the world. Uh, some of these names I'm sure you'll recognize, not only the studios, but also a lot of universities as well. Uh, we have um, a number of universities that use us. So you actually find Texas A&M is actually in that, in the, in, covered in that Forbes article. Um, so, you know, again, we have a lot of coverage. Um, if you watch um, uh, at the NFL, everything that Fox Sports does on the NFL is done on our platform. This, this is incredibly time sensitive stuff. They literally sometimes have to uh, generate all the renders and, and do all the compositing literally, you know, minutes sometimes before it, before it airs. And they turn to us when they need to get that done. We've also done a lot of IP sensitive stuff as well. This was a ad for Mercedes Benz, obviously here that was produced by the Archery in New York. Um, they uh, yeah, obviously had a lot of sensitivity about the design and the style of this car, but this was um, an advert that was created for the Masters tournament in 2018. So that was done using about 200 plus GPUs that we provided for them to go and, and do that. Um, so, you know, we're vastly scalable, basically we leverage the cloud, we leverage Oracle, we leverage Google, we leverage some others as well. You can pick the kind of machines that you want, you pick the power of machines that you want, and basically you can submit many jobs. And we also handle dependencies as, as well. Um, our platform is very secure. Uh, we've been audited by uh, Facebook. Uh, we respect the, the MPA guidelines. We're not MPA certified yet, but that's something we're working on, but we, they certainly um, we follow the guidelines. And everything that goes through our platform is encrypted end to end. We basically provide you a plugin, a HDA, in this case, obviously with Houdini, or you can go through our Python client API to go and integrate directly into your, into your pipeline. Okay. Uh, not only do we cover Houdini, obviously, which is what I'll focus on today, but we cover a number of applications and a number of renderers. And uh, also we kind of completely, you know, automate the, the workflow, in, including compositing and transcoding as well. Uh, they're kind of bookended by this thing called Envoy, which I'll show you in a minute, which is our um, application that sits on your desktop that does all the file transfers from your environment and then downloads all the results automatically, uh, automatically back. So with that, I'm just going to uh, switch to this switch to this demo. Um, so let me see if you can see this. Uh, let me actually share my whole screen. Okay. Hopefully you can all see Houdini. Somebody say yes, please. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. So obviously this is, a, this is a scene and I just wanted to show something very quickly here. This is, you know, obviously a sim that re mm -hmm. uh, uh, links into a couple of renders that actually links into a transcode. And basically we have our, our HA, our ROP here, you can just basically, you know, just uh, as you, you know, would normally do, just put in that in in that rocket to into your uh, intro out uh, path, and 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 then you just hook it all up. But obviously, I've already done that, so I just wanted to show you very quickly um, how you basically can then just submit your jobs. Now we have I mentioned this thing called Envoy, so this is our application that sits on on your client desktop. 
allows you to transfer the files and get back your uh, get back your results. Okay, and so uh, while that's logging in, then you'll see all the projects that I have already, um, you know, kind of used in this um, uh, in this uh, on this machine. And basically, you know, you just hit submit render. Yeah. Why is this? <laughs> of course, now that I've uh, oh, I've got the wrong one. That's right. Go. And then what it's going to do is actually going to analyze your scene. It's going to find out all the you know the the, the assets that you need. What is actually going to get produced? And it, you can actually decide whether you want to keep that on a cloud or whether you want to automatically kind of get it return back to you. So I won't go through all the little nuances here, but basically then you can just hit go and that's it. It's gonna take all your files and we, in this case, it's just a hit file and it's gonna upload them into, into our cloud. So you can see here and obviously you've got many other files, you, you'll see them listed here. And here it tells you what jobs it's going to run. And um, so basically now it, it's gonna hand over to this thing Envoy, which actually then does all the transfers into our cloud. And you'll see all these files, they get uploaded in this, in this case. And once that's done, then it's going to submit the job into our cloud, right? And, um, and then you'll see like all the files that obviously got uploaded. And then I can go into my uh, console here. Oop, not my mail. <laughs> From there, my portal. And uh, hopefully you can see my portal there. So it then shows you here's basically the jobs that are going to run. And obviously, as you saw there, we handle dependencies as well. So we manage all that whole process of transferring all the files around and, and running all the different jobs as they complete. And so I, I won't wait for all this to run because obviously it's going to take some, some time here. But here's one I did earlier, as it were. And as you can see, I can go in here and, and then I can see not only, you know, this obviously this information about this job that ran, I can actually go and see, you know, all the log files. Uh, and so you can see if there are any issues and, and whatever. And then as this, as this job goes and runs and, uh, and you see it kind of progress, um, again, I won't kind of uh, uh, you know, wait to show you here, but then in Envoy, you'll see actually um, it automatically um, downloaded my renders. So as it actually did all the renders, and these will automatically get, if I selected to do so, get automatically downloaded to my desktop. So here's, a, here's the MP4 file from the transcode that I can just say, you know, just download that to my, to my desktop. And off it goes. And you can see here already downloaded a bunch of files. So the whole point here is we want to make it really easy for you to uh, be able to submit, you know, quite complex chains of, uh, of jobs. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we can take care of all the complexity of running that in the cloud all securely. Okay. Um, just a quick thing about pricing, obviously, uh, very key. Everything is in the pricing that you see on our website. So if you go to gridmarks.com slash pricing, you'll see all the prices there. It includes all the machine costs, includes all the licensing, includes the storage as well, up to some reasonable amount. Um, you know, there are no sort of minimum hidden fees. The prices for the machine start as little as $1 an hour. And uh, we build by everything to the second. We uh, obviously support a pay-as-you-go on-demand model, but you can also subscribe to our service as well if you do more, you know, kind of episodic work or more regular work. And if you know any, uh, uh, you know, universities and or students who are interested, we do provide a discount uh, as also help by side effects. Um, so just in a quick summary, uh, so our platform is very scalable and sure. We have a pretty much 24 by 7 uh, global support, including people who are actually specialized in, in Houdini and can actually help with their is issues with your scenes. Um, we cover the entire workflow. As I said, we not only cover Houdini, but Maya and Redshift and various others as well. And it's very easy to step up and, uh, set up and use. You basically just download the HTA, put it into your scene, and download Envoy and do all the file transfers and, and job submissions. And, uh, and the pricing is, you know, is, is, is flexible, it's very transparent. Uh, if you go up to gridmarks.com right now, gridmarks.com slash sign up, you can get a, an account and get $10 uh, to basically go and try out our system. And uh, today, you know, for attending, the Singapore hug, 
um, we're offering a $20 promo. Basically, when you go and sign up, put in that SGHUG2020, and, uh, and then we'll give you an extra 20 bucks for you to go and, um, and kick the tires and, and, and really test this out. So um, that's all I had. Uh, like I said, I wanted to keep it brief because I, I know most of you wanted to listen to uh, what Eunice had to say. So unless there's any questions, obviously you can drop them in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll hand off to, to, to Eunice. Well, thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, Hakim, yes, sorry. Um, yeah, that was a really nice presentation. Um, so then let me just um, bring up the video um, here. Okay, so share. Hi, I'm Yunus Paljolo and I am a senior FX technical director. I have worked at various studios such as Industrial Light and Magic and MPC on feature films such as Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, X-Men Dark Phoenix, Shazam, Aquaman, Alien Covenant, Pirates of the Caribbean 5 and many more. Real-time game development experience at EA as a technical artist on multiple AAA titles such as the Dragon Age trilogy. I also have work experience in Silicon Valley, where I worked at Lyft's Level 5 Autonomous Vehicles Division in Palo Alto. Recently, I also created Pragmatic Vex, the first in the series of advanced Houdini training I wanted to create for a long time. Condensed use of high-end feature film visual effects production experience into dedicated practical concepts that I use frequently. Of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If I were to include all the topics that are useful in production, it could easily span over 8 more volumes just on Vex alone. That is why I wanted to gauge the interest from the community first, before I can commit to the next one. And fortunately, the reception has been overwhelmingly positive so far, especially from various studios all over the world. In this course, we focus on production level applied knowledge and practical techniques, not axioms, mathematical proofs or academics, hence the name Pragmatic. This is an advanced course. Instead of showing you how to do effect X, I teach you how to think for yourself by giving you the technical knowledge that you can use in hundreds of ways. This is the sort of mindset that can take you to the next level in your visual effects work. I have already released 5 lessons freely. You can see them here on the main website pragmaticvfx.com and on my Vimeo channel. I believe in using practical and interesting examples to show things in a more engaging way rather than showing them in isolation. The concepts shown in this course go way beyond what the topic is about, especially if you have the creativity to combine them in endless ways. And as always, thanks for watching. Ocean spectra are useful to generate volumes containing information for simulating ocean waves by modeling the effect of constant wind and tidal pull on ocean waves over time. A complex art-directed ocean shot can have a dozen of ocean spectra layered on top of each other with various masks to have complete control over which ocean spectrum blends with another and where. The result of these can then be used to create realistic ocean interaction with the environment and various other elements in the shot. A common task that can arise in these shots is the need to retime the entire ocean spectra. When you factor all the layers, masks and keyframed animations, in example hero waves, it gets pretty involved to achieve it. Let's first walk through the scene I created. 
There are many ways to create the ocean grid geometry. I took an adaptive approach to have higher detail where the ocean is closer to the camera. So I created the camera frustum first. Then I isolate the top face, flatten it in Y to rest at zero position. Next, add some detail to this geometry. Then inside the for loop, using the camera position as the origin, I gradually reduce a given radius and subdivide the primitives within this radius. Normally, you would use Houdini Catmull Clark rather than Open Subtive Catmull Clark, as the former will preserve the boundaries between the polygons at each subdivision level, rather than breaking up the geometry into multiple pieces the way Open Subtive Catmull Clark does. I use Open Subtive Catmull Clark for performance. If you switch to Houdini Catmull Clark, you will quickly see it takes exponentially longer. So I will switch back to Open Subtive Catmull Clark. Then I reduce the radius by a given value at each iteration and finally delete all the groups. We can see each region by visualizing them with different colors. I also have an attribute wrangle node at then to adjust the water level if desired. Here I leave it at zero. I also created a mask for the oceans on the other side of the bridge. Now let's take a look at the ocean spectra and the hero waves. I created some ocean spectra for the low, mid and high frequency details and two hero waves combined together. I also unlock the ocean waves node to change the mass type inside, as this parameter is not exposed at the HTA level. It is also a good practice to mark the nodes inside the lock HTAs differently, so other artists can see easily what has been changed. I did the same for the other ocean waves node. I also have the output nodes to write out the ocean spectra data to disk, which are referenced by the ocean shaders inside the material network. And with that said, see you guys in the next lesson. Let's retime the ocean spectra to be three times faster than the original. Your first intuition might be to use the retime sub, which uses time shift internally. First copy the output frame range into the input frame range and make sure the input frame range is three times longer than the original frame range, given the same start frame. Connect the retime node after the merged ocean spectra. This achieves the retime operation that we needed, and as such, this concludes the presentation. Or does it? Retiming ocean spectra involves a lot more than a simple time shift. The timing of ocean spectra is evaluated using a set of attributes. If you look at the result between the original and the time shifted ocean spectra, you can see a difference. But that difference is coming from the animation of the hero waves, which are affected by the time shift operation. Whether you need to retime the hero waves or not depends on the notes you have received. But most of the time, when you are asked to retime an ocean shot, it will be with respect to the ocean spectra rather than the speed of the hero waves. If you are asked to retime the hero waves, they will be mentioned explicitly, either by speed or to appear at specific frames with regards to where they start and end. If you remove the hero waves, you can see that there is no difference between the original and the time shifted ocean spectra. Replace the retime node with a time shift node and let's look at the attributes that control the timing of the ocean spectra. They are called time offset and time scale, which are primitive attributes. 
If you look at the result of the time shift node, you can see that the time shift node does not affect these attributes at all. And as such, nothing will change in the evaluation of these ocean spectra. And with that said, see you guys in the next lesson. The next logical approach to try is to modify the time scale of each ocean spectrum individually. For this, we can create a global speed parameter to retime the entire ocean spectra. After you create this parameter, reference it inside each time scale parameter by multiplying it with the current time scale value. Change in the global speed will modify the time scale of each ocean spectrum and therefore the global speed of the entire ocean spectra. As you can see, the entire ocean spectra changes. But the issue is, we lose all of the shapes we had before. When you compare the speed of 1 to 3, you can see that, apart from the hero waves, the ocean spectra we end up is completely different. In this instance, it might not be as apparent, but when you look at an entire ocean spectra, you will have certain shapes and motions that were likely approved before retime nodes. So you need to preserve these shapes and motions as much as you can with respect to a reference frame from which everything else is either going to be expanded or contracted along the timeline if the ocean spectra were slowed down or sped up respectively. To understand it better, we need to step back and look deeper. Let's explain ocean spectra using a simplified model. So if you assume ocean spectra is 1D, you can plot their values along the time like this. Time is the horizontal axis and value is the vertical axis. We have three spectra plotted individually and show the combined spectra as the fourth one. Changing the noise offsets changes the plotted values over time. So here we are just emulating a similar scenario by combining multiple low and high frequencies together. So the time scale is implemented by multiplying it with the noise frequency. That means if you increase the time scale, which in turn increases the noise frequency, it will result in plotting values more frequently over the same given time frame. Therefore, when looking at a specific point in time, the values will move more quickly through the same point in time. But notice how changing the time scale and therefore the frequency gives us completely different shapes. As mentioned before, we want to preserve the existing shapes, at least in relation to a given reference frame. So we can just teleport ourselves to a completely different ocean spectra if we only want to change the timing and nothing else. Now let's take a look at how it would look like if we actually retimed while preserving the original shapes. I created a visual indicator showing the chosen reference time. So let's say I choose this exact time to be fixated in both timelines, the original and the retimed version. Now when we change the time scale, you can see that everything is retimed with respect to the chosen time. When we turn off the use reference time option, we lose all the original shapes. So the entire ocean spectra will either expand or contract from the reference point in time. Now let's see how to implement this in Houdini. Before we can implement our retime, we have to understand how time is governed by the ocean spectra. So the parameters we are interested in are the time offset and the time scale. I will first take a look at the dependencies of the time scale to track it down inside the network that uses it internally. As you can see, it is used in an attribute create node. They are directly referenced as this. But apart from that node, it is not used in the volume wrangle here. And if you look at the currently executed path of the network, you can see that there is not much else happening after the attribute create node. That means the answer we are looking for is not here. The only other place that might contain what we are looking for is the ocean evaluate node. So unlocking and diving into this node, we see what initially looked like a pirate ship. Quite fitting for its name. 
Now we have to explore each node one by one, particularly the wrangle nodes, as most likely the implementation will be vex based. And we can see this particular volume wrangle node indeed references the attributes created by the ocean spectrum nodes. Especially this particular line here is very important as it is the one that defines the current time for a given ocean spectrum. A similar code is also used here. Looking at the other wrangle nodes, they don't seem to have anything else that we need to pay attention to. And with that said, let's break down this formula now. Ok, let's first rewrite this formula. Time equals time times time scale plus time offset. New time equals time times new time scale plus new time offset. New time scale equals time scale times speed. What we want is to have new time equals time. And that means time times new time scale plus new time offset equals time times time scale plus time offset. From there, we isolate the new time offset. So new time offset equals time times time scale plus time offset minus time times new time scale, which becomes new time offset equals time scale minus new time scale times time plus time offset. We assign this new time offset to the time offset attribute. Then we assign the new time scale to the time scale attribute. Doing so should let us fixate the reference time in both timelines, the retimed and the original one. Let's see how to implement this in Houdini now. We can finally implement the retime operation. So create a primitive wrangle first. You might wonder why an attribute wrangle but not a volume wrangle. Because we will modify the primitive attributes, time offset and time shift, not the ocean spectrum volumes themselves. Now create three spare parameters. One for the reference frame. One for the reference time. And one to show the current time, so we can see if the reference time matches the current time. I will use 1080 for the reference frame. We need to convert the reference frame into reference time because the formula we saw before uses time, not frames. So divide it by the FPS. As you can see, it doesn't quite match the current time. That is because you have to subtract one from the reference frame before dividing it by the FPS. It now perfectly matches the current time. Just like we have seen in the concept drawing, we first define the new time scale as time scale times speed. Then set the current time offset to time scale minus new time scale times reference time plus time offset. Finally, set time scale to new time scale. I will set speed to 3. You can also delete the current time parameter as we don't need it anymore. As you can see, the result is exactly the same on frame 1080, which is what we expect. Because this is the reference frame we have chosen, so it will be fixated on both timelines. When you look at the geometry spreadsheet, you can see the wrangle node multiplies the time scale by the speed, but also modifies the time offset so as to keep the reference frame fixated on the new timeline. We also need to filter the primitives by the type name, so we only affect the volume primitives. We can do this using an ad hoc expression in the group parameter. Make sure to set the group type to primitives. As you can see, we have 22 volume primitives. VDV volumes have a different type name. We also have some particle systems, which are also primitives so they will also be excluded from the retime operation. 
Now we are only affecting standard volume primitives. If you go to the first frame, you can see the difference between the original and the retimed ocean spectra. Let's look at the flipbook of the retimed ocean spectra. As you can see, it is much faster than the original ocean spectra, except the hero waves, where we kept the timing as is. Now a side-by-side -side comparison. On the left is the original ocean spectra, and on the right is the retimed ocean spectra. As you can see, the speed difference is much clearer now. We have preserved the original shapes and motion with respect to the reference frame that we picked. In a real production shot, you will have more distinct shapes and motions that your supervisor already approved of. So preserving them using this method means you only affect the time scale itself and nothing else. This way, when your supervisor sees your next daily, he won't be surprised to see a completely different ocean in the same shot. And with that said, see you guys in the next lesson.